I think people don't believe in the flood today because they don't have access to the accurate information and evidences that are there. They are simply captive to entertainment, social media. Uh, there you have movies like Noah that in a very fictional and nonsensical way distorts the Bible totally. And for many people, that's the only source they have for something they think is a biblical account. Uh, we have, of course, the whole embedded presupposition of evolution and the geologic column and all of these things which tell students as they come along that uh, the earth has existed for millions, uh, if not billions of years, that man is a product simply of natural succession. A flood is a supernatural event. A flood is a divine judgment. A flood destroyed mankind. And they're not told that there are evidences of these things. They aren't shown the historicity of Genesis to say that this holds up very well in terms of our scientific age. So it's simply, you know, on the one hand, a, a lack of information, and then on the other hand, the fear of man. For the same reason that they don't believe in a lot of the things that the Bible says are literally true, literally history and literally science, the fear of looking silly and the intimidation by people who host science television shows and wear white lab coats. I think it's really that they're afraid of appearing silly in any way. But when you actually go past the surface and look at the feasibility of it and the historicity of it, it's almost inescapably plausible. Conventional scientists, the secular scientists, think that the present is the key to the past. The Bible, in fact, tells us that the past is the key to the present. And the flood is key to understanding why the world is the way it is today, not just the geology, but even the humanity. Understanding the ark and the flood is very relevant to understanding why the world is the way it is today, how we got to be here. Everyone is interested in their history and the flood is key to understanding our roots. In the early 19th century, when the idea of millions of years was developed, it developed as a result of a conscious rejection of the flood and the biblical chronology. Most of the church came to the conclusion that the flood wasn't global, it wasn't really geologically significant, the age of the earth doesn't matter. And so over the next 100, 150 years, the flood was just kind of forgotten. And it still, in large measure today, is ignored by most Christians. They just never think of it and its relationship to the question of the age of the earth, but it's critically important. We can go back and we can see in the fossil record, for example, what happened. When we look at the world around us, when we look at all of those hundreds and hundreds of rock layers, uh, they're sedimentary layers. That means they were laid down by water. The flood is a reminder that God judges sin and God said he's gonna judge the world again. He sent the flood to punish evil at that time and that's why God sent the flood. It's important to punish evil. That's justice. justice. What is just? The reason the ark is so amazingly relevant in the flood is because man's sin deserves judgment. judgment. The Bible clearly reveals that we are now approaching the time when the second global judgment will come. If we don't understand or believe in the first global judgment, then we will not be ready for this final global judgment. So the consequences of the next judgment could not possibly be more relevant. What is at stake is heaven or hell. The Holy Bible, a book inspired and architected by God and written by his people, dating back to the beginning of real human history from the time of man's true origins. A book that teaches us that the earth is not millions of years old as we've been brought up to believe. A book teaching us that we did not come from monkeys or apes or primordial soup, but a book that instead shows us our creator is a loving, merciful, and just God. A God who created a beautiful world in which the entire planet was once a paradise. A paradise that he gave to us to fill up and multiply across. In Genesis, we're shown that God had finished all of creation in six literal 
days. And that indeed, everything he had created was very, very good. In the span of four days, God was finished with the heavens and the earth. And it was on the fifth day that he began making the sea creatures, both great and small. And on that very same day, he also made all of the exotic flying creatures, which flew through the open firmament of the beautiful heaven. On the sixth day, he made all of the majestic land creatures, which included all of the dinosaurs, along with mankind. He also planted a garden, and in the midst of it, the tree of life. But there was another tree God had also placed in the garden, one that God commanded man not to eat from. Sadly, mankind used their free will to sin against their holy and righteous God. With free will comes consequences, and in this case, the consequences of sin would plunge mankind into darkness. Before the fall, God saw everything that he had made and it was very good, tov ot. It was just the way it should have been. It came forth exactly as he intended. At the end of Genesis 1, it says it was very good. God looked at everything he had made and it was very good. And we get some idea of how good it was uh, in the last three verses when God says that both man and the animals and birds were vegetarian. They didn't eat each other. Uh, they ate the plants and the fruit of the plants. That's telling us a lot about how very good the world was. Creation was in a state of innocence. This affirms a fundamental element of God's character. He is good. God is not the author of evil or death. God came into the garden. He had fellowship with man, and they could actually uh, communicate with him and, and see him. According to the way we understand the pre-fall condition. They would have lived forever. God warned him beforehand, if you eat from this, you're going to, to die. While well, Adam did eat. God told Adam, you're going to die. Uh, God said, from dust you came and to dust you shall return. So that's physical death. Through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. Adam and Eve began to die physically. The fall of man affected the whole creation. The ground was cursed. The whole creation is groaning in bondage to corruption. Sadly, the reality of the fall is now easily seen wherever we look. In this broken world, we see pervasive death, violence, corruption, lies, hate, and sin. Man is exiled from the place of God's own presence, and that uh, fellowship is not restored as it was. Man is going to have to labor by the sweat of his brow, and then he will return to the dust from which he was made. That is what has happened to the world. And so it describes entropy, the, the whole idea that things are subject to decay, dissolution, finally death. The whole world is, is like this. It has a limited shelf life, so to speak. It changed the world profoundly. Pretty much everything was corrupted. The human soul, even, even the, the creatures were suddenly carnivorous or poisonous. Diseases and viruses emerged that were otherwise benign. It just radically changed everything. It even changed plants. Plants suddenly became weeds and choked out the crops. The ground was cursed. Thorns and thistles began to grow. We don't live in the original very good creation. We live in a fallen creation, a cursed creation. The fall was a massive, catastrophic, world-changing event. So everything was corrupted. It's, it was a tragedy on the highest possible level. Evil had to mature before God unleashed the first judgment. The Lord God had made a beautiful world in which everything was once very good. But when the first man broke God's command, man's domain was plunged into sin and death. 
which only grew worse with the progression of time. And it was not just man who had been corrupted, but all under man's dominion. Animals became carnivores and turned on each other and man. Where once the earth had been filled with God's goodness, now was filled with the celebration of evil and endless violence. Paradise, along with man's innocence, was now gone. Jesus would tell us later that just as in the days of Noah, so too would the world become again just before his return. Most flood geologists point out that the world, the Earth, had a, a more global, warm, mild climate. And the evolutionists believe that too. It's not just because of continental drift that we find pine tree, forest, and dinosaur fossils on Antarctica. Not just because those continents were once in different places, but because the Earth had a warmer, milder, global climate, heavier, lusher vegetation, greener, thicker, forest that stretched further towards the poles and away from the equatorial zones. Right now, we just don't have the kinds of forests that could generate uh, the coal deposits that we have or, or uh, provided the, the vast source for the, uh, the, the carbon that would have been necessary for the coal seams that we have today. We would have had to have had a lusher, warmer, more forested, more vegetated uh, earth. Clearly, the amount of vegetation in the pre-flood world was far superior, uh, far more luxuriant. Today's world is a desert by comparison to what the pre-flood world would have been like. A much gentler topography, a much easier climate, much more prolific vegetation and animal life. We have many creatures in the fossil record that are just like today, but they were much larger. So giantism in the fossil record, that indicates that the pre-flood world was much more suitable for biological life. Originally, at least, it wouldn't have had impassable mountain ranges. It wouldn't have had huge desert areas. God created the world to be inhabited. Prior to the flood, mankind had wrecked their environment to a large degree. The Bible talks about the wickedness of man. In Genesis 6, it speaks of every thought of man's heart was only evil continually, and that the whole world was filled with violence because of man. To me, I think it would be a, a very frightful place to live. The intents and thoughts of the human heart were only evil continually. The earth was filled with violence and all flesh had corrupted its way on the earth. So it was excessive sin and violence and wickedness. And God said, I'm going to destroy the earth. The remnant, Noah and his family, uh, they found grace in God's sight. Apparently they were not of those that were corrupted. God took that remnant of mankind, was able to preserve it. But one of the things people find interesting is the lifespans of humans before the flood. And Noah was 600 years old. And after he got off the ark, he lived 350 more years. He was 950 years old when he died. Now his sons that got off the ark didn't live that long themselves, but they lived into their 500s. And then the next generation, the next generation, the, the 400s, the 300s, uh, we are getting to 
Terah, Abraham's father, living into his 200s. Abraham lived to be 175. And it was an exponential decay in the lifespans. Adam and Eve had no mutations. The first 10 patriarchs before the flood had very low mutation rates. And so they were all living to be about the same age. Something happened at the time of the flood. And that's when this incredible uh, degeneration of humanity happened. There was this incredible decline in longevity. When you plot the data, it's astounding because the data, which is straight out of the Bible, and you wouldn't expect scientific data in the Bible, but the data follows a strict decay curve, and it's stunning. In the Bible, we are told that before the flood, men lived to be nearly a thousand years old. The average age of men at the time was so staggeringly high compared to today that some have a difficult time comprehending how such longevity was even possible. Yet, a major clue lies within the ages given to us in the book of Genesis. In almost computer-like fashion, the book of Genesis reveals that the post-flood lifespans of the genealogical line of Adam follow a mathematical concept known as exponential decay, meaning that if you were to graph the lifespans of all of the men after the flood, you don't see a linear line gradually sloping down, as you would likely see if the ages were made up. But instead, what you see is an exponentially decaying curve with minor variations since no two people are alike. Would the men who recorded these ages through history really have conspired together to create data that follows an exponential decay curve? Instead, what we see resembles exactly the type of data we would expect in the aftermath of a worldwide flood, revealing a steep initial drop-off of lifespans just after the flood due to the catastrophic environmental changes. No more access to nutrient-dense foods from the world that was lost, and genetic mutations that were not before present. The truth is that no one at the time of recording these metrics would even think to plot them in an exponential decay curve if they were making up fiction. This sophisticated decay curve is actually the result of a real and easily provable flood event. The objections to Noah's flood are mostly ridicule and, and laugh out loud. The only serious things are Maybe trying to say, well, where did the water go? Where did the water come from? And then lampooning Noah's Ark. There was a Discover Channel special called Noah's Ark, The True Story, where they showed actors portraying the traditional biblical version of the story of Noah's Ark. And then they showed you the true story. That, and Noah was dressed in a tunic, was bare-chested, had a shaved head and looked like an Egyptian, and Noah's Ark was a beer barge. I'm not kidding. Look it up. Discover Channel, Noah's Ark. The true story? How do they know that? Asserting that that's what the real story was. And then watched it fall apart into pieces as it, of course, was structurally not sound, ridiculing the structure of the Ark. When I was a master's student at Ohio State University, I looked at the geometry uh, of the cross section and of the length of just the straightforward reading of the Bible. And I found out that it's dynamically stable 90 degrees in pitch mode and 90 degrees in yaw mode. It means it'll go all the way up to 90 degrees and it'll come back. It's stable. Not that that wouldn't have caused problems for the people and the animals in the ark if it had been tilted that much, but that does show the stability. Certainly, whatever they could have taken in the uh, uh, turbulence, the ark could have taken structurally. This is a 200 scale ark, and I put it in my swimming pool, and we put a measurement device on here that was one inch, and so we were able to scale the waves. And do you know that it scaled to 500 foot waves, and it was still stable, never turned over. 500 foot. A tsunami, by the way, is about 100 feet. So it lets you know about the dynamic stability of this. Most of biology didn't need to be on the ark. Uh, most plants didn't need to be on the ark. Most insects didn't need to be on the ark. Only the creatures that have breath in their lungs. Most of the species live in the ocean, which do just fine in a flood. So the Bible doesn't say that Noah was to take two of every species onto the ark. It was to take two of every kind 
the same word that's used in Genesis 1 that talks about God creating different kinds of plants and animals to reproduce after their kind. And so we think there were maybe only about 1,400 kinds and about 7,000 animals on the ark. Average size, maybe a large sheep or a small cow, but most creatures much smaller than that. We're not talking about, for example, two Great Danes, two German Shepherds, two wolves, two coyotes. He took two of the dog kind on the ark. And uh, we know from modern genetics that there's tremendous genetic variation built into the DNA for, for each kind of creature. And so creation scientists have been studying, well, what was the created kind in comparison to our modern classification system? And they think that in most cases, it was equivalent to approximately the family level. The evolutionists just exaggerate because they focus on species. Evolutionists often claim that it would not be possible to fit all of the species of life on Earth onto a ship the size of the Ark, even when factoring just how humongous Noah's Ark actually was. At roughly 50 feet high, 85 feet wide, and more than 500 feet long, the Ark is the largest wooden vessel known to have been built by man, with the USS Wyoming, a gigantic wooden schooner built in 1909, coming in at second at 450 feet long. Yet, regardless of size, imagining how the Ark could fit 18 million species of all life on Earth is a rather elementary level way of understanding the excellent efficiency of the Ark's economy. The reality is that the sea creatures, insects, invertebrates, and plant species did not need to be included on the Ark. You see, God instructed Noah to only bring the vertebrae land animals. And when you simplify those animals to their genealogical class structure found in Genesis, which is known as a kind, you can further significantly reduce the number of animal kinds needed down to around roughly 1,400 kinds, or approximately 6,750 animals in total. Of those animals, you also don't need to bring fully mature adults, when smaller juveniles would fit better, eat less, waste less, and live longer while reproducing in the post-flood world. With roughly 6,750 animals on board the ark, we can now also estimate that approximately 1,400 cages were needed. And when considering that only 20% of the ark's volume was needed for food storage, you can see that we have plenty of room left over for cages and infrastructure, with the remaining area able to fit the equivalent of 483 semi-trailers within its volume. It's also no surprise that the dimensions God gave for the ark turned out to be optimal for stability. In fact, if we were to scale the ark up, it appears that modern cruise ships have taken notes from the ark's dimensions, as you can see striking similarities in shapes and proportions that they share. As you can observe, the influences of the ark are alive and well today and have long reaching implications in virtually every field of science including baromenology, botany, hydrodynamics, anthropology, and more. But as compelling as the science behind the Ark is, we must not forget that it is God who orchestrated the events. It was God who decided the time to judge the world had come. And it was God who was ultimately responsible for the deliverance of all who were aboard the Ark. In the second book of Peter, we are told that in the last days, before Jesus Christ returns, people would deliberately ignore the evidence of the flood. Or as the Bible puts it, they would be willingly ignorant of the flood. Peter tells us that in the last days, men would mock the Bible and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And instead, they would walk after their own lusts, just like they did in Noah's day. You see, just as Noah 
had faith to carry out God's command to build the ark, and just as Noah had faith that God would bring them through the flood, so we too must have faith that God was perfectly capable of preserving Noah, his family, and all of the creatures aboard the ark. Is it too difficult a thing for the God who created the universe and everything in it to preserve the life that he chooses? Of course not. So let us not be counted among those who Peter prophesied would ignore the evidence of the flood, since we are indeed living near the end. Instead, let us be named among those who believe in God and his word. The Bible says that on the day that the rains of the flood began, all of the animals with the breath of life were on board the ark with Noah and his family. And it was God himself who would shut them all in and save them from the coming judgment. The global nature of the flood is given in the biblical text, and it's quite clear, especially going to the original terms that are used. The term for the flood itself is mabul. The unique Hebrew word mabul, it's used only one other place in the Old Testament. That is in uh, Psalm 29, verse 10, where it says that God sat as king at the flood. It's a very unique term that sets this account apart from other types of flood. So this was a unique flood. First, we could talk about the flood itself, the purpose of the flood. Contrary to what many think, it was not simply to destroy sinful man, but also, Genesis 6 tells us, to destroy all the land animals and birds, not in the ark with Noah, and to destroy the surface of the earth and only a global flood would accomplish that purpose. Then we can talk about the, the ark. The purpose of the ark was not to save a few animals so Noah could start a farm after the flood. It was, as Genesis 7, 3 says, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. And then we have the repetition of universal terms. Everything that is under the whole heaven, under the whole earth, everything in which is the breath of life, those words appear 60 times in Genesis 6, all, every, under heaven. And when you have a repetition of those words, that is emphatic. Secondly, we have the duration of the flood, 370 days. Why such an extensive flood if it was only local? I mean, why that duration of the flood? Why would it take so long for it to recede and dry up? There's no way a local flood could last that long. We have the depth of the flood. It covered all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens. And since water seeks a level plain, it would have to be a global flood. When the scripture says that the waters rose to about 24 feet above the mountains, even if you give uh, the idea that the mountains were not as high as they are now, they were upthrust after the flood, you still have water only rising to its own level. If we had a local flood, then obviously there's no need to build an ark. If the flood was local in the Middle East, the ark was totally unnecessary. The animals didn't need to go in there. And he could have told Noah and his family to go on a vacation to Europe or Egypt. Noah and his family could have walked to a safer place. And then why an ark at all? Why, why such a large ark? Why all the animals? Why, why the birds? The birds could fly away. Animals, there are animals in other places after all, if it's a local flood. Just this whole idea of everything included in the ark, uh, two of each kind, means you were trying to preserve all of life at that point. Only a global flood fits the purpose of the ark. Then we could talk about the volume. It was way too big if it was just a local flood. You also have the, the very theological concept that if you had men elsewhere who were not part of the judgment of the flood, then the whole idea of, of a judgment on mankind for corruption of the earth would make no sense whatsoever. God says, I've seen the wickedness of man that's great on the earth, not just in one local place, but on the earth. When we come to the New Testament, you have a passage like 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. It compares a flood that destroyed the world that was 
with a future judgment uh, on a coming world or the world that now is. If you had a local judgment in the past, you'd have to have a local judgment in the future. But of course, this is the second coming of Jesus Christ to judge his world, and it has to be universal. Well, if the flood was just a local event, then what do you think? Maybe when Jesus returns, just a local event? <laughs> no, it's going to be a worldwide judgment as well. And I would add one last thing, and that is we can't find the Garden of Eden. People look at the description of the geography where the Garden of Eden was in Genesis 2. The reason we can't find the Garden of Eden is because the pre-flood world was completely destroyed. It is now uh, buried under thousands of feet of sedimentary uh, deposits. So the flood was not a local flood. The Bible tells us that God looked upon his creation and behold, it was all corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Judgment Day had finally come. Even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is on the earth shall die. Every non-flood geologist on our planet believes that the planet Mars had a global flood. Creationists do believe, like the unbelievers, like the secular geologists believe, Mars did have a flood. We think it happened the same time our flood did. Maybe an asteroid storm hitting the inner planets, the rocky planets. Here on our planet, we're now currently covered 70% with water, two miles deep, and they can't buy that we once had a flood. 
it's very, very easy for them to believe that Mars had a global flood, but for some reason they can't accept there's plenty of evidence that we've had a flood. Where did all the water come from or the flood? I mean, where did it come from and where did it go? Well, look at the globe. We're three fourths covered with water two miles deep now. It's all still here. The most asked questions are, where did the water come from for the flood and where did it go? And the answer is easily explained in the model of catastrophic plate tectonics. The process of catastrophic plate tectonics is very similar to conventional plate tectonics. The main difference is the speed or the rate at which these processes unfold. Today, the plates are moving about uh, a few inches per year. However, during the flood, a billion times faster. When the flood began, it, it began with these fountains on the bottom of the deep ocean. Where the Bible even says the, the fountains of the great deep were opened up. The mid-ocean ridge is 44,000 miles long. Most of it is underwater. That's why they call it the mid-ocean ridge. And if it all erupted at the same time, it would have made the ocean floor do this, wham, and then the mid-ocean ridge would have erupted all around the world at the same time, roughly. But that first phase, wham, would have caused sea level to rise a mile, plow. Then this tidal wave coming out from that sudden rise at the ocean floor in the middle, headed towards the continents. Now that would have been the phase one of the flood. The second phase of the flood, it says, was when the windows of heaven were open. It's no accident that there's an order given there in the scriptures. The fountains of the deep broke open, that is the crust breaking open, the water shooting up, the supersonic steam jets, and carrying that ocean water up, then it fell as global torrential rainfall. People all know that the flood was 40 days and 40 nights of rain, but the waters prevailed upon the earth for 150 days. When the fountains of the great deep broke open, as the Bible describes, that's the description of the fracturing of the pre-flood crust. You've got molten material that's expanding as it solidifies. The new ocean floor expanded. That pushed up sea level. That means that the ocean floor is actually going to rise. The ocean waters rose up to cover the continents. The new ocean floor cooled and it shrank and therefore sea level fell and the ocean waters drained off. The flood waters are still present on the Earth's surface today. They went into the new ocean basins that were produced as a consequence of the flood. In fact, the earth is still 70% covered in water. Yeah, the water's still here. It's, it's deep in those trenches. Some of the trenches are eight. Now we find out 10 miles deep. If we had lower land formations and a higher ocean floor, we would probably be a water planet today with no land uh, surface. And it's scraping the bottom of the barrel to try to say, where did all the water go? It's still here and it's very easy to explain that the same water, mostly the same water that's here, would have been adequate to have flooded the earth at one time and that the situation has changed. That water is now in deeper basins. Not a problem in the flood model at all. We're all familiar with the theory about Pangaea, which holds that the continents were once connected to form a supercontinent that later broke apart through a process called plate tectonics. Catastrophic plate tectonics is essentially the same idea as conventional plate tectonics, except that the timeline and events are all centered around the year of the flood instead of millions of years of slow processes. You may be surprised to learn that it was a man named Abraham Ortelius, a famous cartographer from the 1500s, who first proposed the idea that the flood of Noah may have been responsible for tearing apart the Americas from Europe and Africa. Hundreds of years later, another Christian by the name of Antonio Snyder Pellegrini would first theorize the modern concept of continental drift in which he illustrated two maps depicting the continents of the world as once joined together. This was decades before German geologist Alfred Wegener would propose his own version of the theory known today as Pangaea and be erroneously dubbed the father of continental drift. Antonio was snubbed of this honorary title. His crime was citing the book of Genesis, in which he said he made the discovery that at the beginning of creation, 
there is only one continent. You see, the book of Genesis laid out exactly what happened to the earth in the past during the flood, starting with what the Bible calls the fountains of the great deep opening. It wouldn't be until the 1950s that technology initially developed to detect submarines underwater would stumble across these gigantic scars from the fountains of the great deep that had split open exactly as the Bible had described. How did a book thousands of years old know exactly what was at the bottom of the ocean floor? The Bible says that first, these giant subterranean rifts broke open, piercing the Earth's crust, spewing magma that created steam jets that shot up into the sky. Then the book of Genesis says that the waters poured down as torrential rain through the windows of heaven that were opened up, and that the rain lasted 40 days and 40 nights. The supercontinent that the book of Genesis described is now beginning to break apart. At first, the newly partitioned continents oscillate, slamming into each other before starting their ultimate journey of separation. This closes seaways and forms volcanoes and mountains in the Americas and Europe, such as the Appalachian and Caledonian ranges. The seafloor spreads, forming from molten magma, widening the separation between the new continents. Scientists will later discover that the seafloor at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is much younger than the seafloor in other parts of the world, exactly as the Bible suggests. As this newly emerging volcanic floor spreads, it subducts under the west coast of North America, binding and releasing, causing massive tsunamis carrying mud mixed with sea creatures, totally overwhelming the land as what's known as the Conjugate Shatsky Rise pushes up during the subduction, the Rocky Mountains also began to form, along with the Independence Dyke Swarm, a 400 mile long volcanic region that billows ash that covers half of America. As the Western Interior Seaway emerges during this time, the last of the dinosaurs are flooded, mixed together with sea life, and are buried in mud sand and ash in the middle of America. As we near the end of the flood, activity begins to cease as the seafloor stops spreading and begins to cool. As the new massive ocean floors cool and retract, the waters reverse back down into the new ocean basins and recede as much as a mile. All over the earth, trillions of fossils are left behind as incredible evidence of the worldwide catastrophic flood. The most compelling evidence for a global flood is the sediment record itself. All over the earth, what's under your feet, hundreds of distinct horizontal layers, generally with smooth interfaces between the layers, the only way that such a record could have come into existence is global scale processes producing the whole record in a single global event. All over the world, the layers are flat and there's no river channels in them. Think about what you see at the Grand Canyon. You see these flat pancakes, one on top of another, just flat, 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 flat. They're basically erosionless. Here's how they formed. At the beginning of the flood, there was movements of the crust. Crustal movements actually cause earthquakes. Earthquakes in water cause tsunamis. The tsunamis then originating from the ocean areas would then race across the continents. Once the tsunami lost its power, the sediment would settle down out of the water and form a flat layer at the bottom. That's the first layer. Then another earthquake in a different part of the world sets off a tsunami, maybe a week later, maybe a day later, brings in a different sediment. The tsunami runs out of power in this area. The sediments in the water settle to the bottom and form another flat layer. There's no erosion. Again, you have a third tsunami bringing in these sediments, third layer. My simulations indicate that these tsunamis were large enough for a single tsunami to sweep all the way across a continent. 
these layers were formed underwater. That's why they were so confusing to so many people. It's fascinating to see the evolution scientists explain their dig sites. For example, at Dinosaur Provincial Park, they have 10,000 dinosaurs buried in this flat layer. And you ask the site paleontologist, well, how did these 10,000 dinosaurs get in this flat layer? Well, they died in a river in flood. Oh, what was the shape of the river bottom? It was a flat river bottom. So you're saying this river that was so strong that could bury 10,000 dinosaurs over five miles wide, which would be a raging river, wasn't strong enough to cause an erosion channel? Why isn't there a river cut from this river channel? Why isn't there erosion from that river? The answers make no sense in light of this flat problem, the erosionless problem. What we see at the Grand Canyon is that the layers got bent at the edge of the plateau. Because the folding was smooth, when the sediments were still soft, the whole sequence had to be formed rapidly during the flood and then bent at the end of the flood while they were still wet. And so these folds are very strategic evidence tying together all the layers and it emphatically demonstrates that the millions of years never happened or the fact that you have uh, what are called polystrate fossils. They're usually trees that go through more than one layer. These trees have three layers that are supposedly 30 million years worth of rock around them. You know that if you start accumulating sediment around the bottom, that sediment would eat away at the bark, the bark would rot, and the tree would die even sooner, would fall over even less than 100 years. But here we have trees, vertical, fossilized with three layers. In the worldwide flood, trees were swept up and they were floating on the top. Now, eventually, the trees became waterlogged and sank to the bottom. Now, trees normally sink horizontal, but some trees, as discovered by Dr. Steve Austin, when they sink, they sink vertically. If a tsunami wave comes, and there was a lot of tsunami waves during the flood, and brings in sediment, when the tsunami wave loses power, the sediment in the wave settles into a flat layer at the bottom. Maybe a week later or a day later, another tsunami wave comes in from a different direction. When the tsunami wave loses its power, the sediment begins to fall, and now it forms a second layer on top of the first, amongst this vertical tree that hasn't fossilized yet. Now, if that tree could be buried with 30 feet of sediment, in just, say, a week, you could easily accumulate the entire Grand Canyon stack layers in a year's time. It is the explanation that defeats the evolution time, and it actually defeats the theory of evolution. This is the single most important geological fact, and nobody seems to teach us in college or in the evolution world. Evolutionists claim that the Earth is millions of years old, and one of their so-called proofs are stratified rock layers found within the geologic column. Evolutionists teach that each layer represents millions of years of rock formation based upon their uniformitarian view that says you can make assumptions about the past based upon processes today. But in doing so, you're assuming that there were no catastrophic events like a global flood. Evolutionists also ignore the flood evidence contained within these rock layers, like sea creatures mixed together with land creatures. Just ask any coal miner, anywhere on earth they dig, they find countless sea creatures embedded in the rock. You see, the Bible refutes evolution theory, stating that it has only been roughly 6,000 years since the beginning of creation, giving the true account of how the sedimentary layers formed, as sedimentary rock is rock that is formed in water which is also incredible testimony of a worldwide flood, given that the Earth's surface is made up mostly of water-formed sedimentary rock layers. The fact that the layers were actually formed in water also explains why there is no erosion found in between the layers, as there would be if the layers took millions of years to form. Then there's the issue of bended and folded rock, which could only occur if the layers were pliable and soft at the time of the bending, which is exactly what a global flood would cause. 
the bent layers also prove that their formation was rapid, with multiple layers forming rapidly on top of each other, because the bottom layers would still have to be saturated with water and didn't have enough time to dry out. As forces acted upon the layers, they bent in unison from top to bottom. Claiming these layers folded together over millions of years while still forming cannot explain what geologists are observing. Only underwater rapid burial could explain these phenomena. Remembering that sedimentary rock layers of which these are, are formed in water in the first place. To further prove that these rock layers were formed quickly and in the flood is the fact that in countless places around the world, we find poly straight trees. Poly meaning many and straight referring to the multiple layers that these trees are running through. If you understand anything about how organic matter decomposes, you'll know that it's impossible for trees to remain intact for millions of years while layers of dirt and debris slowly pile around them and rain and moisture rot the wood out. Instead, what the evidence shows is that trees were swept up in the flood and carried off. And as they became more waterlogged, they sank. Some trees would sink uniformly, while other trees contained more water saturation in what was left of their bottom roots. These trees would be bottom heavy and float down to the floor, but rest upright. Tsunami waves would carry in sediments that would bury the trees quickly in multiple layers. In fact, geologists discovered that the same sand from the eastern side of America had been carried in tsunami waves all the way to the west side of the continent. This explains how the rock layers contain fossils of sea creatures mixed in with land plants. And it also explains why the trees are missing their root systems, and most importantly, why the trees are found running straight through multiple rock layers that evolutionists are claiming are millions of years old. Let's also not forget that some of these layers are the size of continents, indicating that these trees and rocks were laid down in a single and catastrophic event, and not local floods at different times. Today, we assume that fossils are a normal part of the cycle of life, since we see so many of them all over the world. Yet, fossilization is not what we observe at all when something dies today. Thankfully, dead matter does not fossilize today under normal conditions, but instead, God made dead matter to break down and return to the earth. The fact that we see so many fossils indicates that there was a worldwide event that caused mass fossilization of all life on earth at one point in time. Think about it. If the earth today is covered 71% in water, Water formed sedimentary rock layers made up most of the rock on Earth. Inside those rock layers are sea creatures mixed in with land creatures. Some of these sedimentary layers span entire continents, meaning they were formed all together in one event. Multiple layers are bent and folded together, proving rapid burial events created them. We find trees spanning through multiple layers of rock, and all over the globe, we find massive areas of erosion, such as great canyons carved out. It is obvious that God left all of this evidence behind as a testimony to the biblical flood. The second most powerful evidence are the fossils that are in these sedimentary layers. To produce a fossil requires, in most cases, especially for the larger kinds of organisms, requires complete burial and rapid burial. And that automatically speaks of catastrophic conditions. So the fact that we find so many fossils, so well preserved, many of them with evidence that the animals were buried alive is another powerful evidence for a flood cataclysm. There's a lot of fossils in museums. In fact, the museums are full. They, they don't want any more fossils. The, the, the basements are full. Museums have collected one billion fossils. And scientists suggest that in the rocks, and you could find these, 
there are trillions of fossils. If you see an animal die along the side of the road, like a possum or a deer, pretty soon that deer or that possum is gone. The bones disintegrate, scavengers come, the mice eat the bones, the pelt falls apart. 10 years later, it's just dust. There's nothing. And yet there's these trillion fossils. Here's why we have a trillion fossils. There was this enormous flood. It was a worldwide flood. Tsunamis were racing across, bringing in sediment and quickly burying these animals. As the flood receded, all this ocean water percolated back through these through the sand that was covering the animals and provided the minerals to change the bones into fossils. And that's how you get trillions of fossils. You have to have a worldwide flood. The one thing we frequently observe is that the fossils have been exquisitely preserved. What do I mean by that? Well, we find all the details preserved in place. For example, fish about to swallow another fish and, and it's been buried. That, that tells you it had to be very rapid to preserve those details. Another example, we've got ichthyosaurs, which are marine reptiles, some of these up to six feet long, and uh, they've been buried with, in the process of giving birth to a baby. Another case of you know, 10, 12 foot long fish with an undigested fish in its stomach. The details of, of, uh, of wings of, of wasps. The wings are open and the legs are in the flight position. What can we think about? They were flying. And those insects were trying to escape. They're trying to go somewhere, but they just got trapped with all the sediments of the waters of the flood. And that, that's why we can uh, study them. All these details require extremely rapid burial. It fits exactly with what the Bible says. It's consistent. The destruction of the flood was rapid, sudden, catastrophic on a global scale preserving these creatures sometimes in, in, in life positions, caught in the, in the action of doing something and the details exquisitely preserved, that's consistent with the biblical record of the flood. It may surprise you to learn that all of the rock layers of the world, the name rock layers like the Cambrian, the Jurassic, all of the layers of the world have saltwater creatures. <laughs> well. What greater proof would you need that this was from a worldwide flood, that there's saltwater creatures in all the layers? Now, this is in the middle of the continents. How did these saltwater creatures get here? It would have to be a flood. Now, the evolution scientists have to explain where these saltwater creatures came from, how they got there. You're saying, Mr. Evolution Scientist, that there's saltwater creatures in all these layers, and you're saying the oceans rose, covered the middle of the United States and went back down, went back up, went back down, multiple times, at least a dozen times. Occam's razor would say, it's more simple to believe in one flood than more than a dozen worldwide floods. It was in the 1980s that the secular geologists began to move to catastrophism and move away from uniformitarianism as soon as it suited their needs. They went to catastrophism when it served their purposes to help explain the extinction of the dinosaurs. Noah's flood provides a better explanation for the demise of the dinosaurs than the impact in Yucatan, simply because that event is so small, so localized, there's no way it could have a, a physical effect that would, would cause the dinosaurs to be buried the way we find them. And nobody and the secular world even claims that. They say, well, it, it produced climate change that caused the dinosaurs to starve to death. If you go on uh, Wikipedia today and look up dinosaur extinction or Chicxulub crater, an asteroid sunk and hit the earth, caused a global cooling because of all the dust in the air and the dinosaurs died out at that time. We have simulations where we've thrown the, the Chicxulub seismometer right on the Earth using high-performance computing, and then we get the subduction event, and we get the breakup of the lithosphere, and we start the earthquakes, we start the volcanoes. Actually, meteoritic impacts could have initiated that event. But it has no power to explain the burial of these huge animals in the sediment record. In the 1980s, secular scientists began to theorize that it was an asteroid that crashed into the Earth and wiped out nearly all of life on its surface. The theory posits that massive tsunamis and volcanic dust-filled air as a result of the impact 
are what destroyed the dinosaurs and most other life in a worldwide disaster. Secular scientists could not escape the fact that water and volcanism played a massive role in how life was once wiped out on Earth. But the Bible had already written that the Earth had been catastrophically destroyed through volcanism and water, and they didn't want to validate the Bible. So they came up with their own catastrophic version of events, i.e. the asteroid impact theory. You see, the Bible's book of Genesis had already made clear what happened in the past in detail, describing volcanic activity bursting open from the ocean floors, chronicling when the volcanic activity began and ceased, how long the rain poured, how high the waters reached, as well as giving the very reason why God judged and destroyed the world with the flood in the first place. You are essentially given two choices today. On the one hand, you have a book written thousands of years ago giving an amazingly detailed account of a worldwide flood that wiped out virtually all life on Earth. On the other hand, you have man-made theories, in this case, one that was only first postulated about 40 years ago due to the inadequacy of their prior non-catastrophic models that they know really didn't work. Both views require a catastrophic event with global implications, but only one has the power to actually explain the stratification of the Earth's surface and the trillions of fossils, along with cultures around the world citing a global flood in their historical writings and legends, while the other merely rearranges elements from the true account to concoct its own story. Think about it. The Bible already said long ago that the entire world's surface was destroyed catastrophically. They have no choice but to make that same claim. The Bible said that the continents were once together in the beginning. It looks like they have to share that too. Nearly all animal life on Earth was wiped out during the destruction, a fact that they also couldn't ignore. Marine life was scattered across the world. The Bible says the waters went above the highest mountains. Secular scientists formulated their own theories as to how to explain the marine fossils away. The Earth's original environment was permanently destroyed. The pre-flood paradise was gone. In the secular model, they refer to this as the prehistoric world going extinct. And let's not forget that the flood set the processes into motion for much of the world to be frozen over. Hot oceans produce evaporations and greater snowfall. Volcanoes send volumes of aerosols into the atmosphere, blocking the sun. Greater snowfall with cooler summers results in global ice sheets. Evolutionists have called these results of the flood the Ice Age. One of these is constantly being proven true as more and more evidence is discovered over time, while the other was only invented after the evidence was unearthed. And further still, contained within the Bible is also the prediction that all of this would happen. In the second book of Peter, we are told that in the last days, which is the time fast approaching, unbelievers would be willingly ignorant of the flood, meaning that secular men and women would consciously choose to believe and create lies that allow them to push the catastrophic event into the distant past. So long ago and so far away, it ceases to be scientific history and becomes scientific fantasy. The irony can only be described as biblical. The Bible makes it clear that the end times would be characterized by increasing unbelief of the biblical account of history and the flood event itself. Sadly, the religion of evolution is one in which its priests are constantly updating their outdated theories, while in the Bible we are given the final, true, and unchanging account. And as the evidence is unearthed over time, the biblical account is always proven to be true. If you go to a museum today and look at the dinosaur displays, 
you'll notice that the animals look strange and unusual with the dinosaurs. Have you ever seen a boa constrictor at a museum display wrapped around a T-Rex's leg? No, but they have found boa constrictors with dinosaurs. Have you ever seen a box turtle at the feet of a stegosaurus? No, but they found box turtles with dinosaurs. Have you ever seen uh, a T-Rex with a, a duck flying over him? No, but ducks have been found with dinosaurs. All seven groups of animals today have been found with the dinosaurs and they look the same. Museum displays don't show that. So if they actually put the animals they found with the dinosaurs, people would look at those displays and say, well, evolution hasn't occurred, it's just the dinosaurs went extinct. But scientists have withheld the modern animals from their dinosaur displays to promote the idea that evolution occurred. You know, the soft tissue analysis in dinosaurs that's been recent has been a little bit of an enigma to those who believe that the Earth and the universe is really old. Mary Schweitzer in the, in the 1990s and the early 2000s first found this like elastic material in, in arteries. Elastic material means you pull it and it, and it and it reloads back to its original place. Dinosaur soft tissue is a very recent finding. They don't want it really getting out. It's not in any of the textbooks. This lady cracked open or cut open one of the bones and you could smell the putrefication. Dinosaur bones shouldn't smell like they're dying because they've been dead for millions of years, right? Well, a little bit later, Mark Armitage started looking at the horn of the Triceratops, but he found bone materials, tissue and bone, the osteocytes, that actually you pull it and it had strains. Strains are how much you deform something. It had up to almost 100% strain. Muscle tissue in the Santanaraptor fossil, and it was like dinosaur beef jerky on the leg bone of a dinosaur, it was the actual muscle. And this Thessalosaurus bone, the same thing. We started looking inside of this bone and we found using scanning electron microscopy that it had elastic material, it had tissue. You pull it apart and it goes back. If this was mineralized or it was a fossil that became a rock, you couldn't do this. So it was never mineralized, never petrified. It was still elastic, meaning it was still the tissue. That means this thing is not a hundred million years old. The biblical account expects to find some of that stuff. So like, what was it? Bone marrow? Red blood cells. Cartilage? Collagen. Hemoglobin? And muscle fiber proteins. These things shouldn't be able to last but a hundred thousand years tops. But these things were a hundred million years old. Okay, 68 million years old, but closer to a hundred million. The amino acids in the protein strands would unbuckle and fall apart into protein powder, and there is no explanation to this day. Nothing that makes any decent scientific sense, and it's just been left as an anomaly. Neil deGrasse Tyson interviewed Mary Schweitzer and some others, and then turned the attention to the medullary layer. They tried to distract the attention away from the red blood cells. The medullary layer was there showing that uh, the T-Rex that this bone came from was at the time carrying eggs. That's really what we call a shell game, a smoke and mirrors game, a dog and pony show meant to distract away from the elephant in the room, which was there were proteins in that T-Rex bone. Now, Mark Armitage, working at University of California, did find soft tissue inside of a triceratops horn. And when he published that finding, they fired him. <laughs> so they are willingly ignorant, <laughs> squelching the truth. And this is actually not science. This is propaganda. Now we're talking about thought control and the mind police. They wanted to fire him because they felt that this was a religious position when really he had only brought forth a scientific discovery. In 1993, a film titled Jurassic Park featured a rather famous scene in which the remains of an ancient mosquito were preserved, encased in a ball of hardened amber. The film goes on to explain that the way scientists could resurrect the dinosaurs from the past was by extracting blood from the remains inside this mosquito, in which dinosaur DNA could be fully sequenced. 
by combining what was missing with that of a modern day frog. This idea came about because back in the 90s, the writer Michael Crichton was struggling to come up with a concept to explain how dinosaurs could somehow be brought back to life in a feasible way in his book of the same title. What the Jurassic Park creators couldn't have imagined was the discovery of soft tissue inside of a dinosaur bone. A finding that has since been replicated by other scientists, such as this stretching triceratops tissue, discovered by Mark Armitage. These discoveries shocked the entire paleontological community and would likely have rewritten the original Jurassic Park film had they known this was possible at the time. In fact, scientists have run into major challenges when attempting to publish these findings because of the wholesale rejection that dinosaur soft tissue could even still exist. The consensus at the time agreed that it was completely impossible because everyone held to the widespread belief that the bones were millions of years old, which would require that all of their biomaterial had long since fossilized. There was simply no way that these dinosaur bones contained biomaterial like blood vessels and proteins such as collagen. In fact, of these 16 types of bioorganic materials that have since been discovered inside dinosaur bones, collagen by itself ends the debate on these bones being millions of years old, as the maximum age of collagen is as low as 10,000 years by some estimates and as high as 900,000 years by others, with 100,000 years being the generally agreed upon maximum age. To put this into perspective, if each of these tiny bars represents a period of 100,000 years, then only one of these bars represents the maximum age collagen could survive over time. If we zoom out to the time span of 100 million years, then we can see that the lifespan of collagen is 1,000 times shorter than the general age evolutionists claim dinosaur bones are. Or another way to say it is that collagen doesn't even last 0.001% as long as it would have to in order for evolution theory to work, proving that it's not even remotely within the realm of possibility that collagen could survive for so long. The relatively short shelf life of collagen proves what the Bible has been saying about these bones all along that they're roughly 4,400 years old and were buried all over the world around the time of Noah's flood. As the flood waters began to recede, the earth was in a state of chaos. Dinosaur graveyards like these would later be found all over the earth and secular paleontologists agree that these worldwide sites share one thing in common. The state the bones are found in all show evidence of flood burial. And now you understand exactly where the water came from. Water that would eventually dry up because it didn't belong there in the first place. The whole earth would undergo a massive reset as vegetation would slowly grow back and water would find its final resting places. Sadly, the earth that was once a perfect habitat for dinosaurs was now irrevocably ruined and those dinosaurs that were able to survive would be hunted to extinction over time. We know them as dinosaurs, but legend would remember them as dragons. And so it was that on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. It was a little over a year after the flood began that Noah 
his family and all on board the ark would finally step onto dry land again. This group of eight people would repopulate the earth, just as legends around the world cite in their historical literature. And science would later prove that this genetic bottleneck really did occur exactly as the Bible had told us all along. In terms of looking at the way ideas progress, we know that history can become more mythical. Myth, as a core idea, cannot become more historical. It doesn't go the other way. History can become more historical. Myth becomes more mythical. And if you start with myth, you end up with myth. You can never go the other way. So we can see as a genre how different they are. There's been about 200 flood traditions discovered by anthropologists and missionaries and others. And many of these flood traditions come from people groups that don't even live near the ocean. There are hundreds of flood legends from around the world, but in many of these cases, you have huge similarities to the biblical account. You have one righteous family that is saved, uh, and the reason for the flood is because God was angry, the gods were angry at something that humanity had done. They all talk about man and animals surviving on some kind of a boat. There are lots of similarities, but the true account is in Genesis. Some of the evidence of that is just in the description of the ark, the uh, Babylonian Gilgamesh epic has a cube for the ark. Well, that would just roll in the water and uh, everything would die. The biblical account has a flood that's duration is 371 days. But when we come to the Gilgamesh epic, it's merely six days. It only took one week to build this huge ark where it took Noah probably 55 years or, or something in that range to construct uh, his ark. The biblical account is the true account and these other stories are the result of people migrating from the Tower of Babel after the flood and preserving in their memory an echo of the true account that is recorded in Genesis. And the farther they moved away from uh, the Middle East and any contact with the true account, the more uh, the, the story got corrupted over time. And so that explains the differences as well as the similarities. The biblical account by all measure stands independent from the others. They certainly had a common core in history. There was an event that happened. We've actually recorded about 23 different uh, accounts that are very similar to Babel, where people were trying to build this tower and uh, the gods were angry or God was angry and forced them to scatter by confusing their language. And then from Genesis 12 onward, we don't see similarities anymore. There's no Abraham legend, there's no Isaac legend or David legend, anything like that. But Genesis 1 through 11, people all around the globe seem to know about why. Well, because what the Bible's telling us is true. And up until Genesis 11 at the Babel event, mankind had a shared history. And then they took that history with them, they passed it along, and it gets distorted as the years go by. After the flood, God blesses Noah and his sons, tells them to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, the same sort of thing that he told Adam and Eve. So in a sense, man gets to start over. And yet, what do we see just a few generations later? The people refused to scatter. They said, no, we're gonna stay right here in the Mesopotamian Valley. And uh, they began to build a tower. They had a one world government. Genesis 11 tells us that God stopped that building project by supernaturally creating different languages to force the people to move apart according to their families into different nations. People then who were biologically, genetically very close began to marry within their language group. And from what we know of genetics, that would bring out recessive genes to become dominant and physical characteristics associated with that. But the Bible is very clear. There's only one race, Adam's race. Paul says that God made from one man or one blood all the nations to dwell upon the face of the earth. So there's absolutely no basis for saying that one group of people with a certain shade of brown skin are superior or inferior to some other people who have a different shade of brown skin. We have no basis to hate people that look different from us because in reality, everybody looks different from me. So if I were gonna hate people that look different from me, I'd have to hate everybody. So we should be uh, loving and accepting because we're all descended from the same 
couple, Adam and Eve. You know, the interesting thing is that most evidence shows that humanity started in the Middle East, which we'd expect if Tower of Babel was true. All these languages seem to have diverged from about that region. As what was now left of the Ark rested in the mountains of Ararat, God made a covenant with Noah, promising him and all of his posterity that he would never again destroy the earth and all life on it with a flood. And God blessed Noah and his sons and commanded them to once again multiply and spread out upon the earth. But on the plains of Shinar, men disobeyed God's command, and instead they came together to build a city and a great tower they intended to reach to the heavens in an ultimate act of rebellion and rejection of God. But God came down and put a stop to their tower by dividing their once unified language into many languages. And out of confusion and fear, they stopped building the tower and dispersed into what would become the nations of the world. It was within a few centuries after Noah and his family departed from the ark that the people of the world were of one language. But today, there are over 7,000 languages in the world, which trace back to an ancestral family group that each belongs to. For example, Italian can be traced back to Latin, its root language family. However, when linguists attempted to trace the root language families further upstream, they encountered a serious problem. The language families would eventually lead to dead ends, otherwise known as language isolates. This directly contradicts the merged root language that evolutionists were expecting to find, or what some linguists theoretically call the elusive proto-world language. Instead, what they find are a bunch of languages that seem to have emerged out of nowhere. Unless, of course, you factor in the events that took place at the Tower of Babel, which provides an incredible explanation evolutionists refuse to accept. Further still, consider that when you trace known languages on a map, something very telling occurs. Many of the earliest languages trace back to one location on Earth, a place commonly referred to as the Cradle of Civilization, Mesopotamia. And what's also revealing is that the time frame of many languages also trace back to that approximate point in time, which is just after the Flood and Tower of Babel in the 3rd millennium BC. Furthermore, linguists believe that approximately 94 proto-language families should exist in theory, and they also believe that this number may lower over time, as more research leads to more mergers. By no coincidence, there are approximately 70 people groups in the Biblical Table of Nations, recorded in the Bible around the time of the Babel event. What are the odds that the estimated root language families so closely reflect the same number of the nations the Bible lists at the time of the Tower of Babel? And what's more is that these people groups also have myths and legends within their cultures of both an ancient flood that destroyed the world and a time when their ancestors attempted to build a tower. These stories, of course, vary, but the core elements tend to remain intact, with the Cherokee and other Native American tribes even including that their language was once changed much earlier in history, as only one example of hundreds. In like fashion, human genetics also reveal a similar pattern to the languages. 
as the genes extracted from over 100 human remains from the so-called Bronze Age era revealed that the further back in time you go, the less genetic mixing there was, with their data showing relatively unmixed genetic lineages around the time of Babel. Which of course is no coincidence. Only God's supernatural intervention can explain the multifaceted bottleneck we see across so many fields of science. It was at this event that God changed the entire course of human history once again. It was also after Babel that God instituted human government and at a time when nationalism is being attacked by those wishing to establish a one world government, it is important to remember that it was God who divided the world into nations. It was God who was against the man-centered, godless society mankind was beginning to fashion. And as any historian will tell you, history has a way of repeating itself. When we come to the story of Noah's Ark, it's more than just a story. It certainly is a part of vital history. There was an ancient world, and that ancient world, because of corruption, was destroyed by a flood. And that was the judgment that was on mankind. Since man has not changed, there is yet a future judgment coming. It'll be just as it was in the days of Noah. They'll be giving and taking in marriage. They were having families. They were doing their work. They were just living life as normal. They didn't believe the judgment was coming. The flood did come and people were not ready. Before the flood, people were eating and drinking and married and giving in marriage with a total disregard to the building of the ark, to what was being preached to them, to all the things around them. And Jesus says, just before he returns, people will be in rebellion, ignoring God, just going on, living their life as if God doesn't exist. They will be surprised when Jesus comes and brings judgment. There was a judgment that happened. There's a judgment that is coming. And we need to be prepared. The Bible does talk about the last days, the end times. Biblical evil, if you look at all of the different Old Testament uh, accounts, would be idolatry, witchcraft, uh, the occultism, demon worship, and things like that, uh, and the perversions that go along with, with these things. Public schools now are teaching against the idea of marriage. They want to corrupt the minds of innocent hearts long before they've even thought about sex at the earliest possible age. Not just sexualized, but sexualized in terms of all possible forms of deviation. Of course, we have the plague of abortion, the sins of Molech, uh, the, the uh, burning of children, the plague of sex trafficking and the exploitation of the vulnerable. These things are the evils and the darknesses of our age, and they're become more prevalent and even massively institutionalized. It's a very good sign, not a good sign, but an accurate sign that we're in the same kind of darkness that was uh, in the days of Noah. And you see that we are in that darkness now. When's the Lord coming back? The Bible says that nobody knows, but when it comes, everyone's gonna know all at once like lightning across the sky. And I tell you, I want to be on the right side. Who doesn't like being on the winning team at the end? I know in this case, it's especially vital in the eternity sense. Eternity is a timeless thing. We don't understand infinity, but we do know it's permanent. The second coming is a wonderful, wonderful image, but it's also a time of judgment. It's also a time of finality. It's also a time of justice. Just as the flood uh, came suddenly, so the second coming of Christ will be sudden. Just as the flood was certain, so the second coming of Christ is certain and will actually happen. That judgment of the flood is a warning of the judgment to come. Jesus Christ is the most written of and influential person in all of world history. But what has made so many throughout the millennia believe that he is who he says he was? God in human flesh, the savior of mankind, the Messiah who was prophesied of in the Bible. You see, the Bible is the only book on earth that has repeatedly proved its inspiration of God. 
by virtue of telling us the future in advance. For example, around 626 BC, Jeremiah the prophet predicted Israel would be conquered, Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed, and the Babylonians would rule over God's people, taking them captive into exile for 70 years. And shortly after this prophecy was written, that's exactly what happened around 587 BC. Then there's Isaiah, who wrote that Babylon's gates would open for Cyrus, a king who wouldn't be born for over 150 years. And in 539 BC, the formidable city's gates were indeed opened to a king named Cyrus and his army. And as foretold, Babylon was destroyed, which both Jeremiah and Isaiah prophesied would happen. And then there's the famous prophecy of Daniel in which he predicted the appearance of the Messiah claiming that he would come 483 years after a decree would be made to rebuild Jerusalem, which is exactly the time in which Jesus appeared. And when it comes to Jesus fulfilling prophecies, there are hundreds concerning him alone. Scripture said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, that the Christ would live in Galilee, he would teach parables, be rejected by the rulers, be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And it was even prophesied that he would be crucified, not stoned to death, at a time when crucifixion hadn't even yet been invented. Furthermore, there are other prophecies, much like Daniel's, that also tell us the timeline of the Messiah. His birth had to happen before the scepter of Judah departed while the temple was still standing, but before it would be destroyed. And very notably, he had to come while genealogical records still existed to prove his lineage was of the line of David. Those records perished when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Strikingly, Jesus Christ walked the earth during exactly the critical period when a multitude of prophecies about the Messiah converged. You see, Jesus warned us that in the last days, the time we are now on the threshold of, there would come a false Messiah who would deceive many into believing that he is the one prophesied about. Scripture refers to this false Messiah as the Antichrist. The Bible says that during this short period of time soon to come, the Antichrist and his system of governance will rise to power. Much like what happened at the Tower of Babel, this singular entity will rule, with nationalism in many places being abolished as their sovereignty will collapse into a single system of total control. Many who don't think and believe as the Antichrist declares will not be able to buy or sell. Many will be put to death. Today, a mass global awakening is transpiring where individuals, irrespective of politics, discern the burgeoning antichrist like infrastructure that is developing all around them, with many recognizing that the plagues, famines, wars, hyperinflation, lawlessness, and acts of nature prophesied of in the Bible are appearing to be orchestrated by design a deliberate transition. As we are on the cusp of a satanic rise of power, a time the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. It's a time in which God will focus his attention back on Israel, specifically as Israel is at the center of many of the biblical prophecies which have yet to be fulfilled. Even now, we can already see one such prophecy found in Zechariah in which God said that in the last days, he would make Israel a nation of distress to all the nations surrounding it. Incredible insight when considering that such a small spot on earth will be at the center of a coming global war. And as the climactic end to God's prophetic plans draw near, the Lord's return and Israel's redemption lie ahead. Out of profound love, God postponed his son's return for earthly judgment. You see, mankind are all guilty of committing terrible sins before a holy God, 
if each person were to give an individual accounting to God on their own merit, they would certainly face a terrible judgment. But here's the good news. God's masterful plan, as unveiled in Corinthians, reveals that while humanity collectively inherited condemnation through one man's disobedience, Adam, they can now find forgiveness and salvation through the obedience of one man, Jesus Christ. If one man can bring death to all through his sin, then it follows that a sinless man can bring life to all through his obedience. Thankfully, God in his wisdom and mercy has given us a simple and easy way to be justified in his sight, and that is through his Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that God created a, a perfect world. Adam sinned, and because of Adam's sin, we are all born sinners, but we also choose to sin. We choose to rebel against God. Every one of us has broken the Ten Commandments in thought or word or deed through the evil that we have done or the good that we have failed to do, through ignorance, through weakness, or through our own deliberate fault. We're all guilty before God. We all deserve His judgment. And the Bible says in Romans that the wages of sin or the penalty of sin is death. And so God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to take the wrath of God for us, pay that penalty for sin, and then He rose from the dead, proving that He had paid that penalty, that He had conquered death, and that He could give us eternal life. We need to respond to what Jesus has done. Every one of us, uh, no one can respond for us. We must each personally acknowledge to God that we have sinned against Him, that we deserve His judgment, and then put our trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. And when we do that, we're forgiven. We're restored to a right relationship with God, to a personal relationship with God, and we're given the gift of eternal life. We've heard that the Ark of Noah was an ark constructed for the salvation of mankind. It had one door in it, and that was a single entrance. That was done by design. God also only has one way of salvation. That way of salvation in the ark was to preserve them through God's judgment, which was the flood. And someone had to trust in God and accept Him and come His way, which is that one way into the ark, in order to be saved. The real problem for us is not the one way to God. It's God. It's that we're wanting to come to someone who now tells us what we need. We need His salvation. It tells us we're sinners, which we don't want to hear tells us that we need to depend upon Him. And I think ultimately all of us deep down realize we are not what we should be. That there is a God who made all these things. We certainly didn't do it. All the, the creation, all the irreducible complexities, all the things that exist simply argue there is a Creator. If that's the case, then we're creatures. And what better place for the creature than in a relationship with the Creator? And the Creator made that possible by Himself going through all the things that we go through but ultimately dying in our place because that's what our sin deserved. Jesus himself said, John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So if we come to the one who is God in the flesh, the one who came to provide redemption for us, and we trust him and take him at his word, he says, I will save you. That's the way to God, and I'm the way. Come to me and you have all that was promised in the Bible, eternal life, a relationship with God, and everything that beyond what we can even imagine in this life is a whole life yet to come that God has promised to those who love Him. Two thousand years ago, God the Father sent His Son to the world to usher in a new era of righteousness and peace. But they rejected the true Messiah. They hated the very one whom the Bible says created love, joy, beauty, 
and life itself. They took and crucified him in the very place he was to establish his glorious kingdom. But God the Father raised him from the dead and made his sacrifice the salvation for many. For Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and in him is no dark.